Our guest today is a rock star in the YA genre. And I'm not going to lie, at least about this, I'm a big fan of her books. E. Lockhart is the author of the number one New York Times bestseller, We Were Liars, and its prequel, Family of Liars. E.'s other novels include the Times bestseller, Genuine Fraud, which was also a finalist for the Los Angeles Times Book Prize, and the disreputable history of Frankie Landau Banks, which was a Prince Award honor book and a finalist for the National Book Award. E has also written the very cool graphic novel, Whistle, A New Gotham City Hero, and the novels Again Again, Fly on the Wall, Drama Rama, and the Ruby Oliver Quartet, The Boyfriend List, The Boy Book, The Treasure Map of Boys, and Real Life Boyfriends. Welcome to the first 50 pages, E. Glad to be here. So we'll jump right in. Uh, Your website is really just this treasure trove of information. You have this great section where you answer questions that you've been asked, like, what does E stand for? What is your real name? When did you first decide you wanted to be a writer? So we aren't going to ask those questions. We'll just send listeners to your website, (laughs) emilylockhart.com. That might be a little bit of a spoiler uh, to find out the answers to those burning questions. And when we reached out for an interview, I thought, Kelsey, that we'd get to talk to a very popular author about the book she had written. But I have really um, liked researching for this interview so much. Uh, e, there's just so much about you and your work that is so interesting. Thank you. So we did learn that you have an academic background, a doctorate in English literature from Columbia. I read that your field was the 19th century British novel and the history of British book illustration. And you've decided to make a splash in the world right writing in the young adult genre. You wrote an article for the LA Times in 2014 that talks about the transition from academia to writing in YA. Can you tell our listeners a little bit more about that journey? Sure. Well, I uh, I partied my way through college a little bit. Who did? And um, <laughs> when I graduated college, I, I had this year, first year out of school, where I really realized that I didn't know everything I wanted to know at all. And I was somehow really eager to go back into that university environment. And so I uh, got this graduate degree in English and comparative literature focusing on, yeah, 19th century British novels, Charlotte Bronte, Charles Dickens, um, you know, all the way up through, you know, Lewis Carroll and, um, Conan Doyle. And I had a rough time at Columbia in a lot of ways. It was an era of um, real, real intense focus on post-colonial theory and deconstruction. And I showed up basically just wanting to like read the Brontes. (laughs) And so I came up against the limits of my own kind of theoretical mind. I was pushed very hard to expand its capabilities and they did expand, but not so very much. I'm just not a great theorist. Um, And so I started writing fiction as a way to kind of get myself off this path. Like I was learning so much. I'm so glad I did it. I proved myself to myself. All of that was good stuff, but it was a super intense old boys network. And it was also focused on all this theory that I didn't really want to do. So how did I get myself off this path? I wrote a novel and then I wrote a book of essays and um, I finally, you know, sort of ran away screaming from academia with PhD in hand um, and started writing um, books for young people not very long after that. And I think my journey was just, you know, a journey sort of through the desire to be validated uh, by educational institutions that I had grown up in and respected, right, Uh, to prove myself in a world of very serious people doing very serious things. Um, And once I had done that, I felt like, okay, now I am ready to make things that bring me joy, that may bring other people joy to do what I am feeling that I am naturally best at without... um, a need for that kind of institutional validation anymore. Yeah, I, I love this quote from that article. 
uh, that you decided to take seriously the person I actually am rather than try to be a person whom others define as serious. Thank you. Yeah, I can be a silly person. It's okay. We find that um, connecting with teen readers, um, you know, we are librarians, um, and it can be a challenge. So even though teens have more to read now, you know, books about the teenage experience from the teenage perspective than they have ever had before, you have high achieving students who don't have time to read for pleasure, and you have readers that are reluctant and struggle to find any enjoyment in reading. How you see the YA novel changing and developing and any suggestions you have for people wanting to reach a YA audience? Well, I mean, the, the, the truth is there's some ways in which, you know, librarians are on the ground reaching readers, and so are educators in a much more day-to-day -day fashion, a much more granular fashion than authors are, right? I encounter teenage readers at book events where I'm only encountering the readers who've chosen to come out and see me, right? Or yeah. at book festivals, mm -hmm. likewise. Um, or online, right? Um, so I'm not encountering your readers who don't think they're interested in books. Yeah. Um, so that said, in, in some ways, I'm not an expert. But I, I think you just write a book that is the book of your heart, right? As best as you can, right? The book for your teenage self, the honest book. Um, for some people, that might be, you know, a big epic multi-generational fantasy. For some people, that might be a you know a small scale coming of age story, but I think the books that end up really resonating with young readers are almost always books written with a certain amount of passion, as opposed to written with an eye to the market. And I think with yours especially, when I read We Were Liars, and you know I've read some of your other books, it feels like there's this real like authenticity and empathy there that says you know like I've been there, I see you, and I think that really resonates with teens that anything that they feel is fake, they're just like yeah whatever, I'm not going to take that seriously or I'm not going to be interested in that. Well, I mean We Were Liars is my most popular book, and it's set on a private island that's owned by this one family, the Sinclair family, right? And the main character is an heiress, an amnesiac, an opioid addict, and um, suffers from chronic migraines. And I'm none of those things. I've never been any of those things. So in the one sense, I'm writing outside my experience. And on the other hand, you know, the thing that is preoccupying this character at the start of the novel is the fact that a boy that she fell in love with um, disappeared after she had an accident. He stopped calling her, she stopped writing, and she can't remember what happened. Um, so they're far apart, but he never even showed up in the hospital um, after her accident. So she can only assume that she did something to repel him, to anger him, maybe she betrayed him. Um, somehow he stopped loving her. And she can't get any closure about it because he won't who's just not in contact with her. And so she's really heartbroken and churned up about this while taking all these pills for her migraines and, you know, dealing with this crazy amnesia situation. So the heartbreak is a really ordinary life experience that I have had multiple times, right? A heartbreak unresolved. Somebody stopped loving me and I never figured out why and I'm dealing with the lack of closure was really, really painful. And that is, you know, hopefully not a universal experience, but a pretty common love experience, especially when you're young. And so I was writing from that place, right? And adding heightened elements of amnesia and this and that and the other thing, mystery. But the heartbreak is relatable, I think, as are the family dramas that are going on in this kind of, you know, elite privileged um, family, they're still, you know, grownups who are arguing and managing their family issues really badly and teenagers who are frustrated and even victimized by the situations that the grownups in their lives are putting them in. And that situation is also, you know, pretty common. And so if I'm writing even a very heightened um, storyline, I'm always trying to look for like the thing 
that I can write emotionally honestly. And that's really such a good segue for us because (laughs) we're very excited to talk about your newest novel, Family of Liars, which is a prequel to Weaver Liars. And you gave us a little bit of information about the Sinclair family um, and um, the first story, We Were Liars. Did you want to tell us anything more about the Sinclair family? Because they are um, very complex. (laughs) (laughs) Well, people should read We Were Liars first. Yes. And Family of Liars second. Yes. And this new book, Family of Liars, is a prequel. So it's set in 1987. And it's a previous generation of Sinclairs when they are teenagers. And so it's basically the story of these three young women, daughters of a, you know, wealthy old money democratic family, kind of like princesses in a fairy tale. And they've spent every summer on this private island. And the year that the heroine Carrie is 17, she's, um, recently recovered from an involuntary jaw surgery that her parents made her get. Um, And so she looks quite different than she used to look. And she uh, has really been through it physically. And she and her sisters find their lives upended by the literal arrival of a boatload of cute boys and one girl. And so this uh, a group of young people arrives, sets up in the guest house. Basically, they won't leave. And um, things go dark pretty quickly after that. <laughs> yeah. And looking at, you know, just the critical reviews for your book, the Horn book said it's formidable, uncomfortably thought provoking, impossible to put down. It, it really is. Um, and I think on your website, it says this, a, a wild ride of a book. I don't know if it's just a time in my life because I'm not a young adult. I'm a middle-aged adult. (laughs) And um, so looking back on when, you know, these were the parents um, in We Were Liars and going, you know, backwards to see them as young and learning and, and becoming the people who they're going to be, you know, I, I just found that a really fun experience, you know, having read. But you also, one of the things that I love is you don't just make us hate the Sinclairs, because that would be easy, right? That this is a terrible old moneyed family, and they're reprehensible in so many ways. But you humanize them. And it, it really makes us think, you know, made me think about how I could be like them in some ways, <laughs> which is kind of a scary uh, exploration of that. But I, I find this paradox, you know, when you're reading a really great book and you're really into it and you want to keep reading, you don't want to put it down, but you don't want it to end. I, I really had that with Family of Liars. That's so great to hear. It was um, a, a strange experience to go back into a fictional world so many years after first publication, right? So We Were Liars came out in 2014 and Family of Liars came out just uh, in June of uh, 2022 or maybe May, I'm not sure. (laughs) Don't quote me on that. Um, And so I was writing after, you know, after a long absence from Beechwood Island, so to speak. Um, So it was a really, really challenging book to write, but it was also really fun because I had never expected to return to that world. And um, there were a lot of, of intense pleasures of basically, you know, during the pandemic, spending my work days on a beautiful uh, private island off yeah. the coast of Massachusetts. Yeah. So full disclosure, you can probably already tell I am a fan of your writing style. I love the spareness of it and your ability to pack a punch with few words. And I'm really curious how much time you spend in the editing and revisions of your books. And at what point do you know when you've got it right? I do a lot of revision, a lot of cutting, a lot of pulling back. Um, I think I'm a more more of a spare writer than, um, than I used to be. Uh, I also really appreciate, like, I love purple prose. I love verbal pyrotechnics. I love authors who show off a bit. 
Um, and so I've been, you know, refining my style book to book, um, maybe not always improving it, but always trying to go somewhere that I haven't gone before in terms of how I'm thinking about sentences and meaning and how I'm using, you know, the inherent poetry of language to create an effect um, in my readers. Um, so a huge amount of time on revision. Um, it, it, I love revision and I, um, I never really feel like it's done. They just pry it out of my hands. <laughs> They're like, you need to stop writing. You need to be done. So, of course, you know, being librarians, we have to ask, how has being a reader shaped you as a writer? Oh, that's a sweet question. <laughs> um, I mean, I could I, I could now talk for two hours, really, you know. Um, I'll say two things. One, I, uh, I was, ra- you know, people sometimes think I was raised in this kind of Sinclair-like family, right, full of, of, of super... Uh, large amounts of generational wealth. And that is not the case. Um, My mom, my mom's side of the family is is a New England waspy family. My dad's side is a New York City Jewish family. Uh, My mom uh, raised me very differently from her family of origin. Um, I spent a lot of time living in communal households in the 70s and 80s um, and uh, was raised, um, you know, by a single parent. So in those communal households, especially when I was young, I was living with people I did not know. Um, They would change year to year or month to month even. Uh, And so I became a rereader. I had favorite books, Pippi Longstocking, Wolves of Willoughby Chase, um, Cheaper by the Dozen. And I would read and reread these stories, which ranged from like sweet family stories to, you know, gothic mysteries, but I loved the fact that I could return to a story and it would be the same as it always had been. And that was a deep comfort to me um, and a profound, I don't want to say quite escape, but a profound like window onto other worlds and other experiences than my own. And so I think that rereading process and that comfort reading behavior um, has stayed with me my whole life. And um, came out of that childhood experience. And then, you know, whatever, I got a doctorate. So, uh, (laughs) you know, you can unpack all of my novels um, by looking at, you know, references to uh, usually like 19th century British literature, because that's what I studied, but also German romanticism and Shakespeare and all kinds of stuff. Um, I, I think I'm just a very not, you know, and also movies and comic books. There's like, you know, in Genuine Fraud, there's all kinds of stuff about Deadpool and the Incredible Hulk. So, you know, I, I mean, that's that's the postmodern condition, I think, for uh, writers and for readers, right? We're all cross-referencing a million things in our heads and even consuming them at the same time. Uh, and I definitely fall into that camp. And I am I am rarely compelled to reread books. Um and that is maybe a condition of working in a library where there is always something new that comes across our desk. Um, but if anyone asked me uh, books that I'm interested in rereading, um, well, I, di- I am rereading We Were Liars for our interview. And I've, I think I am enjoying it more the second time around. Uh, there's just more things I pay attention to that I didn't pay attention to the first time reading it. Um, so that has been really fun. But... Genuine Fraud is on that very short list for me, um, in part because I didn't even know how much I loved an anti-hero story or an anti-heroine story um, until I read Genuine Fraud. It was a bit of an awakening for me. I'm like, I love this (laughs) so much. Um, And I am finding more and more that I am drawn to stories about difficult women. Sure. I love I love stories where there's a monster inside you, basically. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So just as a reader and a fan of your work, I just want to thank you for giving us such great stories about difficult women or complex women um, or young women. Um, I, I do, as I was thinking about this interview, I thought, these are the books that I wish I had to read when I was a young adult. I mean, I enjoy them very much now, but I really wish I had them 20 years or more ago. <laughs> 
Thank you. I usually hear that about a uh, disreputable history of Frankie Landau Banks, which is you know very much a feminist novel. Yeah. Um, but I never heard it about genuine fraud. <laughs> what does that say about me? <laughs> yeah, it's not a role model that character. No, but I love, and and maybe because it was just such a, a interesting way that you constructed the story, and you don't like her, but I want to like her, and um, you know, it just it was a fun ride for me, and I, I'm always trying to figure out the end. My brain works ahead of the story, and then I'm bored if I figured it out, but. I didn't figure it out, and I was delighted and surprised. Um, oh, thank you with the book. So it it, it was fun. Thank you. <laughs> so you had the amazing opportunity to create a character for DC Comics for your graphic novel Whistle, a new Gotham City hero. For those people out there, maybe even a few of us librarians still not us, not us, no. other ones. <laughs> Uh, mistakenly believe that graphic novels aren't reading. What do you think um, this genre can do that other literary forms cannot? Okay, first of all, people used to think that novels weren't reading. Yeah, it's a good point. Right? Seriously, <laughs> right? Yeah. People mm -hmm. who were picking up novels in the late 18th century were like scorned as frivolous. And this goes all the way through, you know, really through the 19th century, right? Serious reading was nonfiction, was history, was philosophy, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And anything that women liked, basically, stories, novels, love, anything, um, you know, was denigrated. But men, of course, were secretly reading novels, too. But it was all considered trash. Anything that was a novel was complete trash. And, you know, then in the 50s, right, anything that was graphic is complete trash, right? Panic about graphic novels and how it's spoiling the minds of the youth. But this is something that is going to go on, right? There's always going to be some form of literature or media that um, the academic establishment is going to fear, you know, heralds the end of true literature or the end of the youth's reading or, you know, is going to corrupt the minds of all the, you know, impressionable young people who are the, you know, the future of our world. But I, you know, I say this as a person with a PhD, I don't think that's true. Um, I, it wasn't true in, in, you know, 1940 something when Superman emerged and it's not true now. Um, we have some of the most incredible uh, literature coming out um, in graphic form. If you really have not encountered a YA graphic novel that you think is a piece of art, I encourage you to go and read Boxers and Saints by Jean Lu and Yang. And I do not think anybody could possibly disagree with the fact, with my opinion, that um, that book is worthy of so much um, analysis and intrigue. It's so complex. It's um, so rich. And that's just a single example. Um, so there's my little rant, but you know, I wrote a superhero comic and I wrote it for a big uh, multinational entertainment corporation, DC Comics. So I'm not saying that Whistle is Boxers and Saints, um, but it was a total joy to interact in that postmodern way that I was talking about, right? With a whole lot of characters that I grew up reading. I grew up reading comics. Um, I loved Batman from a young age and I got to write the Joker and Poison Ivy and the Riddler. No, I didn't write the Joker. I take that back. I meant the Riddler. Yeah. Yeah. I wrote the Riddler and Poison Ivy and Killer Croc. And I s invented a new neighborhood in Gotham City, a, a historically Jewish neighborhood, very much like New York's Lower East Side. And I put uh, heroin with brand new canine related superpowers into this world of Gotham City and specifically into the Gotham City underworld and gave her a lot of moral questions to wrestle with. So I had a grand old time and hopefully the book is thought provoking um, and inspiring, even if it's no boxers and saints. Confession time for me again. This is the first graphic novel that I've read cover to cover. Like I've looked at graphic sure. novels before and I was like, I just don't think it's for me. I just, I'm a reader of books and I just don't, you know, graphic novels are great and maybe that's for, you know, somebody else, but this, you know, but it, Wait, cha you, it changed my mind. Like, Wait, I like, I'm 
like I'm so glad I changed your mind, but like you need to read Fun Home. And you Fun need Home to is read, great. <laughs> and we talk about something more pleasant and you need to read Stitches and like just start with the ones that like won the National Book Award and, and have a go. Yeah, because I, I for some reason, I didn't think that I could be engaged in the story um, as much, but I I loved it. It was and I will de- oh, I will definitely you. explore thank more you. graphic novels. Um, and and it, it's uh, it was it was fun. So. Oh, good. I'm glad you had. To, I'm glad yeah. you're a convert. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> Um, You do also, you've just given us some great book recommendations to add to our own to be read lists. Um, And you also share some really excellent book recommendations on Instagram. Uh, So definitely, I think any listeners who are intrigued should follow you on Instagram because um, it seems that you do have a lot of fun. You share great book recommendations. Um, But also one thing that I did love about some of well most of your instagram posts is that you really are writing poetry in your posts <laughs> it's it's they're just fun to read yeah well nobody really wants to see photographs of me i mean i'll put them up but i figure you know i do words best so um at least you know pretty regularly i try to you know write something funny or thoughtful or pretty for you know to go along with the post because, you know, I don't think anybody is really so much interested in the images that I can produce as, as they might be in, in, in the words. And then once you've read We Were Liars and then Family of Liars, you're definitely want to get going to um, go back to um, the Instagram and just see all the fun content that you've added there's like even a playlist that you have on spotify um Mm -hmm. for family of liars and that was um a fun nostalgic moment for me yeah that's kind of one of my new favorite trends on spotify is that a lot of authors are now creating like playlists for like to kind of create this more like immersive experience as you're reading and to kind of really like make you feel like you're in the story and a part of it as you're reading so yeah, I had a very fun that. time with that. And if people are curious, um, the purple edition of Family of Liars, which was the Barnes and Noble special edition, has all this extra content, and that includes um, the playlist. And also, it's all like formatted like a mixtape with you know eighties. Uh, it's full of songs from nineteen eighty six and eighty seven, and I, it's got like mixtape graphics and other fun stuff. Awesome. So we really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us this morning. And we are so thankful that we were able to get in touch and get to interview you today. Thank you for being superhero librarians. (laughs) Well, thank you. Um, It has been a pleasure. We have really enjoyed it. And um, yeah, I'm definitely going to be watching for all the new stories that you will keep writing for us. So thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you.